going to talk to you about mentorship. And uh, I like to start a little bit with my, my own biases because you're going to see that <clears throat> no, nobody's neutral. We all introduce our biases in whatever we talk about. So I'm not a physician, I'm a behavioral uh, scientist, I'm a clinical psychologist in a school of medicine that has other challenges than being a physician sometimes. So, and I, were, I also co-lead the training component for the Minority Health and Research Center and have a number of training grants, most all of them focusing on cancer disparities. So, <clears throat> this is the definition of mentorship in the Wikipedia, our new dictionary now. Uh, it's a relationship in which a more experienced and more knowledgeable person helps to guide a less experienced or less knowledgeable person. <clears throat> Not my favorite definition, because uh, I was trained in the empowerment model where then you have the, the this, if you're familiar with the work of Paulo Freire, is, is, is this oppressor and oppressed. So th this relationship of mentorship is the mentor knows everything, the mentee knows nothing, and he's going to pass or she's going to pass out her knowledge uh, to that person. Never happens. I prefer this definition that is a dynamic, reciprocal relationship in a work environment between an advanced career incumbent and a beginner aim at promoting the development of both. I have had a lot of mentees and I mentor a lot of junior faculty in the School of Medicine. And I can assure you that I probably have learned more from my mentees than they have learned uh, from me. <clears throat> so uh, I, I always start also saying about mentorship, we all need a mentor. If we are a woman, a minority, or a man, or we always need that person that we trust, that we can bounce uh, ideas off. Uh, I am, you're going to hear more about this, that I am a big advocate of group men mentorship. Uh, there is a mentor that's very good in content, but may not be the best to give you career advice. So sometimes you need to seek more than one person. And working on this for, for many years, what I have found is that uh, there are a lot of expectations from mentees from mentors. Uh, I think the first thing we need to keep in mind is a lot of the mentors do this for free on top of everything else that we have. And when it comes to promotion, I'm in the promotions committee, uh, I can tell you that a lot of the mentorship is not what counts. I mean, it's changing that in, in the School of Medicine, but when it comes to it, if you're being promoted on clinical practice, it'll be your service. If you're, go if you're tenure track and your research and serve in clinical will be your grants and your publications, and teaching will be the uh, more the formal. Uh, teaching that you do. So a lot of the mentors that do mentorship uh, do it because they love doing it. <clears throat> and what's the purpose? It's to really to foster growth, enhance skills. Uh, it is to promote the agency, the institution. Uh, when we recruit faculty, we are the first thing to say that we have a very strong mentoring, at least in the Department of Medicine where I am mentoring component is to provide critical and caring evaluation and feedback, increase practical wisdom, promote opportunities, <clears throat> and what she was talking about earlier, protect and defend against unfair treatment. Actually, uh, the person who asked the question is not here. I think that when she said you need to speak up, to me, the strategy is when you're, you're starting your career, your instructor or assistant, you may not be the one to speak up, but if you have a good mentor, you have your mentor to speak up for you. Uh, and that it can be a very good strategy if you have somebody who is really uh, watching your back. And people have done that for me, 
and I have done that for others because it's true. There are things that I can say that probably if an instructor says this, it's not going to be received uh, the same way. <clears throat> and give or facilitate emotional uh, support. I think a lot of the mentorship that we spend time is really these struggles. It's not much more navigating the system than, than content. The mentor is, uh, needs to be altruistic, and, and you know a lot about this, is, is to provide opportunities to that person. My philosophy, I'm a researcher primarily, uh, so my philosophy in mentorship is a little different than a lot of people, maybe. I do not, I do not want any mentees to do what I do. So I do cervical cancer, and you're gonna hear about my career uh, prevention. I work in the vaccine and screening. Well, I am well known in that area in disparities. So if somebody comes under me and do exactly that, it's gonna take much longer for this person to succeed because it will be this currency name. Uh, it it ends up being more work for me, but I, let's say, now I mentor somebody on sexual health among Latina teenagers. So it's not related to what I do, but she can use the whole infrastructure that I have in the Latino <coughs> community to build uh, her research. Or I have a mentee who uh, works as a clinician in vulvar cancer. She can take all my work from HPV and all that infrastructure and apply to vulvar cancer, and, and then her career will move much faster than if she's done doing under me. So that is my philosophy because of working for many years with researchers. Uh, the primary complaint, primary, number one, my mentor is taking advantage of me. I do all the work and he or she is taking the credit. And how do I get out of that relationship? And it's much harder when you have that symbiotic relationship with your mentor where there is no line what is your research and what is his or her research. Uh, and I will talk about breaking up in a minute because we always need to leave that door open, but it's much harder. So in, for you, if you're starting your career, look for a mentor that can provide you that guidance has the content expertise to introduce you to the right people, but that you do not do exactly or are too close to what he or she does. That's, that has helped me uh, uh, learn that. I, am, I learned that the hard way. Uh, so, so probably I went in the other direction. And it's not only uh, in terms, I do research, but in, and so my, my, a lot of my points are biased toward research, but that person needs to give you opportunities. You know, that the person needs to say, there is this talk at, you know, American Association of Clinical Pathology, you know, I'm going to send my her to give the talk for me, and so then start getting uh, her name out there. Uh, and it's somebody who helped you to be a well-rounded scientist and practitioner. I didn't touch on time. Time is the hardest one. And, and at the beginning of the relationship, that is very important to set it up, to set the expectations. Uh, how often you're going to meet and uh, how much time this person is going to have to you. My advice is set up if it's monthly, it's bi-weekly. I rather a mentee email me and say, I have nothing to talk about this week. We can, can we cancel? And I have the free hour to catch up on emails than getting, getting on, on my schedule. So I am a proponent that I decide that we're going to meet bi-weekly, monthly, and then we have that set up that I, it's easier to cancel than to add something on the schedule. And it's a way for that mentee to be on my radar. Because I mean, when you're very busy, I'll be, I mean, I forget about people. But if, you, if, if the person that's more present, I say, oh, this would be good for Mercedes. Oh, this would be good for Michelle. 
uh, it's easier for me than the mentee that I see call me on as needed. I forget about those. I'm being honest. So what do you really want? The, and that is another thing. When we say mentoring, is that everybody should have a mentor. Maybe not. Maybe it's not for everybody. So we need to see what I need. You know, it's, it is right like a dating relationship. What are you looking for? You know, some of us look for a father or a mother figure. You need to see what kind of person do I need and what kind of help do I need first. Then you look for the person. And I can assure you that 90% of the faculty in the School of Medicine you make a phone call or send an email and say, would you mentor me? They will say yes. Uh, but first, it's not, don't look out, look in. And what kind of person do I need? I, you know, so what kind of personality do I need? I don't do well as a mentor for the crying babies. Don't come to me. And call the complainers. I have no time. That's, I have a colleague who loves the nurturing and the, that's not me. I am more, you know, the, so if you're looking for a nurturing, I'm not, I'm not the one. Um, so you need to look for what kind of uh, relationship you want. Uh, what level of involvement do you want this person to because it's, it's much easier if you, Catherine, I don't do what she does, but Catherine comes to me, the only one I, I know the name here in the audience, so comes to me and said, would you mentor me? My first thing, why did you come to me? You know, if she says it's because you have this many publications, I'm like, mm. now I don't know if that's the right answer. She needs to have an answer, if I go to you, for you to help me. You need to know why I'm coming to you. Um, and what kind of level involvement, what expertise do you need. You always, my secret and my research team and my colleagues that I work with, I go, I look for people who are strong where I am weak. But they'll make me stronger. So I don't know everything. So I surround myself to in areas that I am weak. And then I know other people are strong, and I work a lot in interdisciplinary teams. That is uh, how you make a strong career or a strong uh, research. Uh, and I talk about the personal attributes of mentor because it is a personal relationship. If you're looking for that mentor that you can really say, uh, I'm going to go back to her comment, how I can be less bitchy, you know? I mean, that person can give her honest feedback. Look, I saw you in that interaction you came across. So you need to expose yourself to that person. So another, so this is more the practical talk. Your chair is not your best mentor, and it shouldn't be your mentor. Because there is a conflict of interest there. You know, it's much better if you have somebody outside your division, outside your department who do not have a dog in that fight. Because a chair, I'm the associate director for my division. You know, so I'm looking for the division interest too. You know, and sometimes that gets very blurry. You know, is that on the best interest of this faculty? Or is that on the best interest uh, for my, my division? Being an outstanding scientist is not sufficient and maybe not necessary to be a good mentor. We have great scientists at UAB. Horrible mentors. Horrible. And we have okay scientists at UAB who are great mentors. So also, when you look for that person, see who they mentor. Who, who, what are they, their mentees doing? If they're always still in their labs, this does not apply to surgery. That's a red flag. Uh, it's because that mentor does not let their mentees grow. Um, 
and then you decide because really I do kind of a contract you know what process we're gonna have how we're gonna give feedback to each other um, I'm very tough if you ask me to read a grant or something you're gonna get feedback and, and you're gonna get honest you'll be bleeding uh, if that is not what so that is that what you want and that so that you need to and the feedback is also how can I give feedback to you as, as a mentor? Uh, and then I talk, I mentioned to you about the mentoring team. I'm going to go through this slides because I think we talking, we get more out of this um, than me talking. Um, so, but you set the tone. I mean, you set the journal. Uh, you need to make your expectations very clear what you need because then it's much easier on the mentor. You know, I don't know, I think I want to do this, but I, you know, then it's, it's, much, it's much harder. Come to the first meeting prepared, do the homework on your mentor, be the first one to provide feedback. Uh, the mentor will never chase you. My mentors, if they never call, they never email, you know, my life goes on. Um, most of the time, you need your mentor more than he or she needs you. And then also, another thing that a lot of people, we see that in the leadership. You know, we have outstanding mentors that the mentee never told their leadership how good they are. They need promotion too. They need raises too. So that is very important. And always, always leave the door to end the relationship. Uh, so that's why a mentor shouldn't be somebody in a power relation with you. Because how do you fire your chair as your mentor? And it, it, it gets very tricky. Uh, <clears throat> and then I think the mentor is not that only you need training and, and more uh, 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 other other. You know, the, your peers are the best mentors, actually. And then the mentor will just provide to you uh, with the guidance. <clears throat> Who is in research here? Anybody? None of you do research? So this is more for research. <clears throat> That's another of my pet peeves. People come to me for, in the, for our program and say, my chair wanted me to publish two papers and write a grant this year. And I was like, what is going to, you know, what's, what, oh, I don't know. I just need to write two papers. And so I call roadmap. You, some calls uh, inter, uh, development, I, development plan, individual development plan, IDPs. We need to know what our scientific roadmap is. We need to know what, how, what questions we want to answer. Then it's much easier for us to, and for the mentor uh, to help you, is to really understand the literature and really articulate what pieces of the puzzle are missing <clears throat> and what is going to be your signature. And then I say that the grants and publications uh, it's just your means to get there. In medicine, uh, like I said, I don't see patients, but it's this balance that I get a lot of research in clinical practice. It's very hard to do both. Uh, if you want a research career and be promoted on research, less than 50% in most areas. I don't know surgery. It's unrealistic unless research is really part of your clinical practice. If less than that, do not even put that as one of your areas of excellence for your promotion because you're gonna get hurt. Uh, put service and put teaching because you're not gonna, if you put the research as one of your areas of excellence, you're gonna be graded, you're gonna be evaluated at the same level as somebody like me who does primarily research. So less, 50% usually is my cut. Doing 25% research time and being promoted on research and service. 
we just had the meeting not long ago, you get killed in the promotions. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career and my roadmap. This is where I started. Uh, I was, uh, I want to do cervical cancer screening among Latina immigrants. I was in Memphis and when I started my career and nobody was doing cervical cancer there. I was in the psychology department and nobody was working with Latinos. And so it was a new area, no infrastructure, no mentorship. Those were my challenges. And, but I, 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 you need to decide why you want to do what you want to do. To me, it was the growing of the Latino population. I served cancer in Latinos. I was very involved in the community. I speak Spanish, uh, and I was passionate about it. And I felt that I could do a con make a contribution in cervical cancer as a behavioral scientist. So my first decision there was to move because I was not in a place that was going to help me to develop that infrastructure, that plan. No, I mean, an assistant professor, no mentorship, no infrastructure. I was, uh, <clears throat> I identify a mentor that I emailed in San Antonio and I said, would you mentor me? And her first advice, and she did. People respond. Never met her before. And her first advice was that I need to leave Memphis. And that's when I came to UAB. <coughs> this is my roadmap. <coughs> Just to give you a, a sense of what I'm talking about. This is for, for anybody working cervical cancer here. You know that there is a lot of aspects in cervical cancer from virology to epidemiology to now. I work a lot in self-collection, <coughs> DNA test. I'm a behavioral scientist, and I, I do community-based participatory research. So these are my focus that I can do something about. Screening, vaccine, and sexual risk reduction. These areas are not my area. I will collaborate. I have an interdisciplinary team. But that is very clear where my contribution is. <coughs> I put this there. Uh, so after. <coughs> raking in uh, badly the lead, we can read it. Uh, but the message here is, I want you to read the most, what you teach someone is not necessarily what they, uh, they learn. So sometimes in mentorship, we think we are teaching something and they're learning something else. But I want to share with you three, three, I have three slides on the lessons I have learned in this journey. <clears throat> uh, first, we need to learn about our institutional environment what the infrastructure is for what I want to do. First is an intra, introspection. What do I want to do? Do I have the infrastructure? Who are the researchers? Who is my competition? Uh, am I going to do cervical cancer? As I'm a if you're a behavioral scientist, you're going to do cervical cancer in African Americans and Latinas at UAB. You know, you're going to compete with me. You're going to come, so that's not, uh, unless you're going to do something else. And I'm not using me as an example. I'm not competitive. Uh, I think I'm not. That's my colleague. Uh, who are the researchers? What is the focus in the leadership? Is there something that's value? And your, what you want to do is that value by your leadership. Is it valuable, va valued by your, uh, who are your colleagues and friends? So I think that is very important. And I also, when I say colleagues and friends, is to know who are your colleagues and who are your friends. And uh, it, because we need a lot of support. If that environment is not the right one, move. There are many places out there. I did that, and that uh, was the best thing I did. Not that Memphis was the, if they didn't have, was a bad place, well, didn't have the infrastructure that I needed to do what I want to do. And communicate that to your leadership. Once you have a very clear what you want to do, you need to let them know what you want to do. Because a lot of times, I can assure you that a lot of times they don't know. 
Our chair sometimes do not know. Uh, <clears throat> knowing the spoken and unspoken rules of every institution, we all have those. Uh, and what counts? I was touching on promotion, but it can be something else. What counts? How many times, especially women, I hear, I'm killing myself. And my, you know, and my colleague, usually a male, you know, come and do his thing, and he is the star of the division, and here I am. So then we're doing something, then we're definitely doing something wrong. Build a strong relationship. And I said, told you about this, that I learned to, with colleagues who have the expertise and the talents that you don't have, uh, and have unbiased mentors. Those are the lessons I have learned at least a level of the institution level. <clears throat> Grants is because I do research. I'm not, most of you don't, but starting early, make it simple. Uh, mark very complicated grants. Do not get funded. Get feedback, feedback, feedback. At the, here in the School of Medicine, we have many opportunities with CCTS. If you are starting a project, the nascent is a great uh, forum to present your ideas. They do grant reviews. So we have a lot, a lot going on. Uh, I always communicate with the program director. I never ever submit a grant without talking to the program director first. Having him or her on the phone to, because I don't want to waste my time if it's something that the institute is not interested. Uh, and so a lot of times nowadays one pilot's not enough. You need to leverage and have multiple pilot, but always have your whole roadmap as your guide. Do not search, chase the dollars. Have your roadmap because the dollars change. Today, the, oh, the prior maybe today the priority is obesity. You know, now in cancer we have the moonshot. So now it will be personalized medicine, and in five years it will be something else. But if you have your roadmap and it's very clear, I think that will guide you. I work a lot in the community, so uh, to me, if the credibility is important, because then when I go to collect my data, they need to know who I am. So I do a lot of outreach, uh, and uh, I, I'm well known in the community, and I get involved. Because if you, in our case, we do not do this kind of work. But to me, it is being on the board of Women's Fund is important. Being on the board of United Way is important, but also getting to know the Latinos in the trailer parks, it's also important because they need to know uh, who, who I am. And I work with two underserved populations, another talk for another day. The Latino immigrants, to me, it's easy. I'm, I'm Brazilian. This accent is a real southern accent. Uh, and I feel that with Latinos, I got married and it's for life. With African Americans, I need to renew my vows every year uh, because I'm not one of them. And I need to constantly renew uh, my commitment. Personal, uh, I can learn a lot of lessons. There are very good people out there that are willing to help. We just need to ask. And the worst thing that can happen is you to send an email to somebody and they not respond. And then you move on. So, uh, very, uh, to be open-minded, you have your uh, road map, but new opportunities come along and we can take advantage of them or not. The puzzle is never completed. That's why uh, what made science fun? I started in screening in cervical cancer before HPV. Never thought I'd be working in infectious disease. Uh, now I work in HPV. Now we are in self collection, so it keeps evolving. We really need to listen and work together. That uh, nowadays I think it's very hard to make it on our own. Uh, you, you, and you feel like you're part of the bigger picture, and try not to forget 
why you do what you do. Because if it's not passionate, if it's not fun, don't do it. Do something else. And I see that the daily passion will grow tomatoes. I'm not good. I need to learn. <laughs>